<laughs> Thank y'all for being here. Um, we're really excited. The theme of today is pivot because as you can see, we didn't get all the rooms. So we're kind of squeezing in here together. We almost didn't have a speaker today, but she is here. So I know everybody's crazy busy, but thank y'all for making time for coming here today and getting some professional development. I'm really thrilled to hear what Monica shares with us. So upon that, I'm going to read her bio so y'all know who's talking to you, and we welcome her. Um, Monica Martinez is the Executive Director of Emergency Management at Texas a &M. She provides leadership for the Emergency Management Program for the main campus and remote teaching sites across the state. The Emergency Management Team is responsible for writing emergency plans, providing training for first responders, designing and facilitating emergency exercises, education outreach, and responding to large-scale emergencies on campus. Monica spends most of her time in a hidden bunker in downtown Bryan, <laughs> which is also across the street from Harvest Coffee, she was telling us about. It's, it's known as the Community Emergency Operations Center. Did y'all know there was one in downtown Bryan? Yeah. Yeah. We should know. <laughs> Working with her university team and alongside the local emergency managers to plan for, respond to, and recover from emergencies affecting our cities and counties. She began her career as a member of the AM EMS and AM University EMS as a 911 dispatcher and EMT basic. After graduating from Texas AM in 2005, she worked full time with EMS until an emergency planning position became available within the Office of Security and Safety, where she has worked for the past 15 years. She earned a master's in public administration degree from San Houston State in 2018 with a concentration on disaster management. When she's not working, just not often, <laughs> she enjoys spending time with her family. She has two boys and spends most of her time cooking. Her growing boy, doing laundry, yes. never ends, and watching Marvel movies. In what limited spare time she has, she enjoys working out by training in Mu Muay Thai. Muay Thai, accidentally killing plants she loves, which I have that in common with her. So if Jill was here, she's my plant savior, and she loves cuddling with her scruffy dog Bailey. So let's welcome Monica. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Tracy, and thank you to Teeks for having me today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm going to be really honest with you guys. When Hank first kind of said, hey, you should do this, and Tracy called me, I was like, oh, no, like, I'm not sure that I'm the right person, right? You guys have had some amazing speakers here, um, and I don't necessarily always feel all that inspirational, right? I don't know that I'm this amazing leader that I want to be, maybe, but, you know, kind of that... Uh, what is it? Imposter syndrome that you get, you start talking yourself down. Um, and so I really struggled with, you know, what is it that I'm going to talk about today? And they always say, talk about what you know, right? And so what I know is emergency management. As you heard from my bio, I've been in emergency management for 15 years now. And so I've decided to talk a little bit about what emergency management means for the university, but also how we can apply the principles of emergency management what I do to help prepare the university to respond to emergencies and recover from emergencies to our daily lives. So you're going to get a little bit of both today. So that's why I called it emergency management for life. I wanted to do like a peace sign and like, you know, but didn't really translate very well, the emojis. So we just left it for life. Okay, so you guys should be well versed in this question, but how do you guys define emergency management? Anybody in the room? Proactive versus reactive, okay. What else comes to mind when you think of emergency management? Preparation. Sorry, what? Preparation. Preparation, right? You got to be prepared for these emergencies. Okay. Anyone else? Everybody's busy eating. I get it. It's okay. All right. Well, there's lots of different definitions out there. Here's FEMA's definition. I don't actually love this definition, but I feel obligated to put it up there because it's FEMA and that's what we're supposed to be following, right? Right. 
But really, my favorite definition of emergency management comes from 1978 Emergency Preparedness Project. And it says, emergency management is a coordinated and collaborative integration of all relevant stakeholders into the four phases of emergency management, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery related to natural, technological, and intentional hazards. Wow, that's a mouthful, right? We're going to break it down a little bit. So first, coordinated and collaborative integration of all relevant stakeholders. This is absolutely critical for emergency management. Why? Because as emergency manager, I legit have nothing, right? Police department doesn't report to me. Uh, the hazmat team doesn't report to me. The fire department, EMS, right? All that I have are the relationships that I build on a regular basis, right? I have to be able to reach out, work with all of these different groups on a regular basis to say, hey, when something happens, I know that you have resources that we might need, right, to help support the university's response. And also, if there's ever something going on for you, I might be able to connect you with those right resources, right? That's the key with emergency management, those relationships. So here are some examples. Again, I told you guys, you guys are going to get a little bit of a lesson in university emergency management with this. Um, these are some of the people that I work with on a regular basis on campus. We've got university police, EMS, environmental health and safety, transportation, utilities, all of that different alphabet soup that we need to bring to the table when something happens, right? And it's the same thing for life, right? You have to have your network. You have to have those people that you can call upon to help you. And then also who know that you're there to support them in a situation, right? For me, that's my family, my friends, colleagues, mentors. I had to put this picture of my parents up here because I think they're absolutely precious. But if it were not for my parents, I can tell you that I could not live the life that I live right now when it comes to trying to balance that mom life uh, and my professional career, right? I rely heavily on my family, my parents in particular, to help me pick up my boys, get them to all of the things, right? I can tell you the mom guilt would be so much worse if I didn't have my stakeholders, my family to help me with that, right? Um, but it goes beyond my parents. You know, I've got my family, my friends, my colleagues. Um, I can tell you that I'm one of those people, how many people in here, when you're driving, you're leaving a meeting, something happened, you like call your best friend on the phone, right? In between meetings, you're driving. That's totally me, right? I leave a meeting, I may not be the happiest about it. I don't know. Sometimes things can be stressful, right? <laughs> I immediately get on the phone with my best friend. If she doesn't answer, I go to my second best friend, right? Like I'm going down the list. Somebody got to answer because I need to talk about this right now, right? That's how I manage my stress, leaning on my friends and my colleagues to be able to vent about what happened or maybe to talk about how amazing things went. Like today when I leave here, I'm gonna call my friend and say, hey, this presentation went amazing, right? Um, but either way, whether it's for venting or for sharing, things, having those friends and colleagues is critically important as well, right? Building that network of those people that you're relying upon. Um, and then last but not least, of course, is your mentors, right? I've been incredibly blessed in my life to have amazing mentors. Some of them have come in just for small periods of time in my life, right? Others have been there for the full thing. Um, I can tell you that very recently, my supervisor um, and mentor of 14 years retired. Some of you in the room might know him, Chris Meyer. I mean, I learned so much from him. I am so thankful for everything that he taught me about navigating this professional world, right? And I will be really honest, it was hard when he retired. Thankfully, we still have a great relationship. I'm still able to call him. We still do lunch regularly. Um, but you know, it's important to have those mentors around you to say, okay, is the direction that I'm taking in my life, whether it's personal or professional, is this the way I wanna go, right? Should I be thinking outside the box? Is there something different like I should be doing? Um, and so having somebody, whoever that is, to bounce those ideas off of is critically important. So just like in emergency management, having the right stakeholders, building that network is important. It's also critical for your personal life as well. Okay, so the next part of this definition is going into the four phases of emergency management, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. So we're gonna break this down, talk a little bit of emergency management and a little bit of life. So first, mitigation. Mitigation is the efforts to reduce the effects of risk associated with hazards. Shameless plug here, continuity mitigation actions. How many people here are familiar with hazard mitigation? 
sure there's several of you out there. Okay. Um, right now we're going through the process of updating the countywide uh, hazard mitigation plan for Brazos County. Um, and so some of the actions that you would put into place for a hazard mitigation plan and emergency management would be like floodplain management, uh, possibly, uh, you know, property acquisitions. If there's a certain home that's always flooding, things like that, maybe public outreach projects, preventive maintenance. Um, shameless plug, the Brazos County survey is now out. So here's your QR code. There's also a tiny URL there. Um, but Brazos County is going to be seeking your feedback as a community member for the types of hazards in your area. Um, so we just got that link yesterday, so I wanted to put it up here today so I could be the first one to get it out there. But when it comes to mitigation, it's all about prevention, right? What are those things that we can identify? What are those hazards that we can identify? And how? what are the things that we can do to um, you know, minimize those hazards? And some of that is preventive maintenance. So mitigation actions for life, right? Uh, preventive maintenance is critical. I can tell you I'm not as young as I look, right? Things are starting to break down. I need to do that preventive maintenance, people. Um, and it starts with the basics. I know it's things that we don't ever want to hear, um, but that's the truth. You got to go to the basics. So nutrition, making sure that you're eating healthy, um, that you've got a balanced diet, all of that fun thing, making sure you get enough sleep, making sure you're doing those well checks, all of those kind of stuff. Managing stress. How many people in this room are stressed on a regular basis? I'm stressed like literally 24 seven. If I don't wake up like worrying about something, then I work, wake up worrying that I'm not worrying about anything, right? <laughs> something must be wrong if I'm not stressing about something. That's just the way I live my life. Um, but the way I manage that stress is by doing Muay Thai. Uh, so this is a picture of me. I'm probably like six months pregnant, pregnant in this picture. I can tell you that I absolutely love kickboxing. Maybe it's because I'm Hispanic and I just have a lot of pent up aggression. Maybe it's because I have a high stress job. I don't know, but I absolutely love punching things. Not gonna lie. Um, and this has been an amazing outlet for me. Um, I actually kickboxed my entire pregnancy. Um, my son is four now. I kickboxed the day I went into labor. Be real honest, at that point, I was just boxing. I was not kicking. I was like a little bit off balance. Um, but the point is, it's something that I found that I love that has really helped me. Um, in the past several months, I actually had a knee injury from kickboxing. So I've had to take a little bit of a break. It's been really sad for me. Um, but I found other ways to manage the stress in my life. And again, those are those mitigation actions, right? I've got to do these things. Because if I don't, I know that I'm going to feel overwhelmed. I'm not going to be my best self all of those different kind of things. So you got to think about what are those mitigation actions that work for you, right? Okay, so next we're going into preparedness. So after mitigation, preparedness. So those actions taken prior to an emergency to facilitate response and promote readiness. So this is where planning, training, and exercises come into play. So from the university standpoint, the way uh, we do our planning is we've got an overarching um, interjurisdictional emergency management plan for Brazos County. We are seen as equal response partners on that plan. We're very, very fortunate here in Brazos County that our institution of higher education is seen as an equal response partner. And part of that reason is, of course, because we're like a small city, right? We have our own police department, EMS, um, hazmat teams, all of those different things, facilities, some power generation as well. Um, so we're very, very fortunate to have that working relationship. Um, but part of this plan, we also have our emergency operations plan for the university. So that goes into more details about what we do in different types of disasters, et cetera. Critically important, that plan is our foundation. Now, I can tell you that as a professional plan writer, most people don't read the plan, right? Nobody's going to pull it out. I can just pretend to myself that somebody's going to read it. I send it out once a year. I hope that somebody looks at it. But really, where does the value lie in the planning process? Or in the plan, I should say. I gave the answer away. The process, right? It's the process of bringing all of the right people together, sitting down and thinking strategically about, okay, what is that that we need to do? Who has command control? Who's responsible for what, right? That is the point of the plan is making sure that you come together, you've sat down with all of those relevant stakeholders and you have direction to what you're trying to do in a response in particular. So the same applies to your life, right? We need to um, operate with intention, right? 
Uh, there's different kinds of plans out there. Obviously, for me, I have to think about daily. What is it that I'm doing? I'm a list person, right? I have to write down on the list. Okay, tomorrow I've got these things. Here are the things that I need to make sure that I accomplish tomorrow, right? Sometimes it's a week long list where I'm thinking, okay, um, on Sunday night, I'm looking at my calendar for the week. Okay, what do I got to do? I have this presentation that I'm giving. I better start writing that. It's on Tuesday, right? Um, all of those kind of things. It helps to keep me on track, helps me know what that plan is going forward for the week or for the month. And so the point is we have to be intentional about our time. So many of us are running ragged in any different directions. And by so many of us, I definitely mean me, right? Um, my kids are going this way. My, you know, professionally, we've got all of these things that we're juggling. And so making sure that we sit down and we think about, okay, what are my priorities, right? What do I need to be focusing on? Whether it's the daily plan, the weekly plan, the monthly plan, and then ultimately looking at your overall strategic plan for your life, those goals that you have, right? <clears throat> when I was first a baby emergency manager, long, long time ago, I said, you know what, I don't really know where this career is going to take me, but I know that I want to be the best emergency manager out there, right? I want to work hard. I want to do the best job I can, and I want to see where this career can take me, right? Um, and so because I had a plan, I was able to then look at, okay, what training do I need, right? What are those gaps that I have? If I have this goal of being the best emergency manager that I can be, then what does that mean for me, right? And that's the same for emergency management. So we've got plans that we put together. Once we put those plans together, that's where we can identify, okay, what are the trainings that we need to have for our first responders? You guys, I know, are the um, the experts at training, right? So you guys know all of these things, uh, whether it's NIMS training, communications training, crowd management training, all of the different things. It's not enough to have a plan on a shelf, right? These are the things we say we're going to do, but how do we actually make that happen, right? We've got to get the people who are going to implement those emergency plans trained so that they actually can do those things, right? Well, it's the same thing in our lives, right? Once we create that plan, again, whether it's the daily, weekly, monthly, that long-term strategic plan, then we have to figure out, okay, how do I get there, right? Break it down. Sometimes it can be a little overwhelming, but just looking at, okay, is there a specific professional development that I need, right? Um, are there certain conferences that I need to be attending? Um, certifications, things like that, right? Um and these are not just for professional goals. You can also have personal goals, right? Um, when my mom retired, she taught school for 30 something years. She knew that she wanted to learn how to do stained glass, right? So she took a class in downtown Bryan and now she makes beautiful stained glass on a regular basis. That was a skill that she was lacking, right? She knew that was a goal that she had and that's what she did. So even if we're not talking about professionally, what are those goals, but even personally, what are those skills that you are lacking or that you need more practice on looking for those opportunities to get that additional training for me again going back to that baby emergency manager that meant getting all the female online classes that i could take right um going back to uh, emi the emergency management institute getting my master um, exercise practitioner certification eventually i went on to get a master continuity practitioner certification and then I realized, okay, I still needed to do more, right? I still wasn't where I wanted to be professionally. And so even though I was really scared, because I don't know why the GRE just like really scared me for some reason, um, I went back to school. And so I went to graduate school and I got a master's in public administration. Um, and so, you know, I did one class at a time because I was a single mom with a small child and it took me forever because I also have a super high stress job, right? I didn't have a lot of time to just sit there and do homework during the day. So after I put my son to bed, there I was getting out my computer, you know, doing all the things, writing all the papers on the weekend. But I can promise you that it was worth it. And part of the reason that I knew what I needed to do is because I had that goal, I had that plan, right? I'd identified where my training gaps were and I started to put that plan in motion, right? So once we have the plan, 
We train up. Now it's time to put that plan into practice. That's where exercising comes into play. We're not talking about the Muay Thai or the hot works or the rowing type of exercising. We're talking about putting our plans into practice, exercising those plans. Um, from a professional level, I can tell you that exercises are one of my favorite things about my job. I literally feel like a movie director because I get to one, be this criminal mastermind and put something really crazy um, on the books. And then I get to put all of these pieces into play, right? Um, I'm gonna have a hostage situation and a bomb and there's gonna be all of these things. And then I get to kick over the first domino and see what happens, right? That's pretty awesome. But I'm way better than a Hollywood movie producer because I only get one take, right? <laughs> well, I got one take to make this happen, right? Um, so these are some pictures from an exercise that I did in 2017 out at the Nuclear Science Center and at the airport. And so it did, it involved um, the nuclear reactor, it involved a hostage situation, it involved a plane crash. Um, Teeks, the fire field actually lent me a fuselage, so we actually crashed that. We moved it with a crane, but it was crashed on the Nuclear Science Center. It was really amazing. The only thing that was missing was Bruce Willis like parachuting onto the nuclear reactor like at the end. Um, but we had over 300 first responders um, out there. It was amazing. My favorite things, full-scale exercises, but they're also a lot of work. Putting our plans into place and practicing them is a lot of work, right? But it's worth it because this is where we're going to know if the training that we've done, if every of the plans that we put in place, if those relationships that we've built are actually going to stand the test, right? Are we going to be able to do the things that we said we're going to do, right? That's the value of exercising from an emergency management world. But it's also critically important for our personal lives as well, right? We have to put ourselves out there. We have to take opportunities to practice our skills, right? Um, again, back to the baby Monica emergency manager, you know, that meant volunteering for committees, even though I might not have been the most confident about my skills at the time or putting myself out there and saying, hey, I've never planned a full scale exercise before, but I'm gonna take, I took some classes. And so now I'm ready to, you know, be the lead on this, right? Um, I took lots of opportunities like that at the very beginning of my career because it gave me that opportunity to build the skills and put those skills into practice. Sometimes that might mean, you know, accepting an opportunity to speak, um, stepping out of your comfort zone, even when you don't feel like maybe you're the best qualified, right? Putting yourself out there, practicing those skills is really going to help you solidify all of the things that you're trying to do. Okay, so mitigation, we've you know addressed some of the risks, preparedness, all of these things that we're doing, planning, training, exercises, ultimately it's so that we can respond, right? From a, an emergency management standpoint, there's lots of different types and different ways that we respond to disasters, that we implement our emergency plans. Um, at the university level, for a small scale event, we usually have UPD, EMS, transportation services, facility services, all of those different groups together. We set up a command post. I know you guys know all of those things, so I won't go into response too much. Um, but I've had the opportunity in the 15 years that I've been at Texas A&M to experience a lot of different things that have happened on our campus. Um, would anybody guess that this picture right here, does this even, does this, no, I don't think it does, but that one right there is in the MSC, the Memorial Student Center. Yeah, we had a controversial speaker. Um, I won't even say his name because it's not worth saying, but he came to AM um, and we had protests, we had counter protests, we had to literally push people out of the MSC. This was actually at the doors when we had finally gotten them out, but it took probably like 45 minutes to an hour to push all of these people out um, of the MSC who were trying to um, rush the area that he was speaking in. Um, I can tell you that in that command post, you could have heard a pin drop. We were watching the screens. We were all holding our breath because you guys know in those crowd management type issues, it's just one thing to tip that scale and probably not in your favor, right? Um, but we had the benefit of our plans, of our training, of our exercises, of building the relationships with Department of Public Safety, uh, the state troopers, of building the relationships with all of the different groups that we work with on a regular basis on campus so that even though when that controversial came, a speaker came to speak, we only had about, I don't know, eight days notice maybe, 
Um, we were able to, you know, <clears throat> put an event action plan into place, um, bring all of the right people, set up the command post, right? Because we had that planning, that training, those relationships, right? All building up to response, making sure that we can respond effectively to anything that comes our way from an emergency response standpoint. And the same thing applies in life, right? Life is gonna throw us all kinds of challenges. Um, in the last five years, I've had the opportunity to work, obviously the universities shut down um, and restart and return to normal for COVID. Um, unfortunately, I was not one of those people that got to go home um, and spend time at home with my family. I was working in the emergency operations center in downtown Bryan, long hours, especially in those first couple of weeks, trying to figure out what we were gonna do from the university standpoint. Once that kind of settled down, then we had the Brazos County uh, vaccination hub. And so that was managed out of the emergency operations center and the AM team had a critical component in helping to manage that vaccine hub as well. That's just one piece. Uh, then, you know, in the last several years, we've had lots of challenges on campus, right? I don't know if you guys have heard, um, but we've had lots of university organizational challenges that have really tried <clears throat> our, our structures that we've had in place, right? The relationships that we had built. Um, and that has been really challenging because as people have changed in the organization from an emergency management standpoint, I'm having to rebuild those relationships, right? I'm having to find out, well, who's doing what now? Well, who's in charge of that? I don't even know if that person is still here, right? I've worked with the same person for 20 years, and now I don't know who this other person is. And guess what? They don't know me, which means that when that emergency happens and I have to call them, they're not going to know who I am, right? Um, so that has been a challenge for sure. And then <clears throat> I mentioned earlier my supervisor and mentor. I had worked directly for him for 14 years. That is a long time, right? Um, I can tell you that having the right leadership, um, having uh, working for somebody that you love is really important. You know, I was very, very blessed that he also helped to give me those opportunities, make sure that those opportunities to take leadership positions on those committees or for those exercises and things like that. He helped pave the way for that. Um, and so I've been extremely blessed, but also, you know, it's been challenging to have to learn, okay, work with different people. Um, <clears throat> And so all I can say when it comes to responding to life's challenges is to remember your plans, right? What is my focus here? Trust in your training. Okay, I can do this, right? Yes, things are different, um, but I have those skills. And if I don't have them, well, guess what? I can still go out and get more skills, right? I'm constantly learning. Um, but then also make sure that you can roll with the punches, right? We're going back to that Muay Thai thing, right? Sometimes you've got to weave, sometimes you've got to bob, right? Um, and that's okay, right? Your plan is not there to be um, set in stone exactly what you have to follow. Step A, B, and C is there to guide you, right? But you have to be able to adjust accordingly depending on what life throws your way. <clears throat> Which leads us into recovery. So we've kind of gone full circle here. And recovery is the actions taken after the emergency restore um, and return to normal operations. So for an emergency management world, that means your continuity plans. How many people here are familiar with continuity plans? Hopefully everybody here has a continuity plan, right? What do you do if there's a fire in this building and all of a sudden your office suite is taken out, right? What do we do? Uh, what functions are we gonna continue um, to manage? What things can we do from home or in alternate operations? I can tell you that COVID was the ultimate test of continuity plans, right? Before COVID, I would go train people on continuity and I'd be like, yeah, well, you know, things like infectious diseases, but that will never happen, you know? Mm -hmm. Or people are like, oh, it's like really hard for people to get, wrap their minds around what that means that, you know, my entire operation is altered, right? Now everyone's like, oh yeah, we just jump on a Zoom. It's fine, somebody's not in the office today. Okay, well you sick, you still gonna be working today. So get on that Zoom, right? <laughs> it's kind of changed the way we operate as a whole, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but that's where continuity plans into play. So once that emergency is over, looking at, okay, how do we resume our normal operations? How do we continue? Um, how do we, um, you know, if we can't do our normal operations, then how do we adjust? 
How can we be resilient with our plans, right? So it's the same thing in life, right? We have got to be resilient. We have to look at our plans and we have to say, okay, this challenging event has happened. This disaster has happened in my life. I'm going to do a quick after action review. What's gone well? Okay, well, I'm still employed, right? I still work for a university that I love. That's great. Um, you know, what do I have control over that I can improve upon, right? Because we don't have control over anything, everything, right? So what is in my power? Well, for me, that's my perspective, right? The only thing I can control about the last five years of my life is my perspective on everything that's happened. So looking at these challenges as opportunities, right? I've had the opportunity to build new relationships. I've had the opportunity to expand my skill set, right? Step into more leadership roles, right? I've had the opportunity to learn to lean on others. That's something that I will admit is very hard for me, right? I'm one of those people that says yes to everything, right? Do you need help? Yes, I can do that. Oh, you've got this? Okay, yes, I can do that too. Okay, you need a tabletop exercise tomorrow. I have three things, but yes, I will make that happen, right? Um, that's just my personality. I want to always be the perpetual helper. But at the same time, I've had to learn, maybe I need to establish some healthy boundaries, right? Maybe I can't say yes to everything and that's okay, right? Maybe I can lean on those other people in my life, those other relationships that I've built to say, hey, I can't really cover this, but I know somebody who can, right? Learning that I don't have to do everything by myself, right? I can lean on the support of other people. And so for me, that has been the biggest thing is turning these challenges from the last five years into those opportunities that I've had to practice my skills. And then of course, always looking back at, okay, well, what else am I still missing, right? I've survived these last five years. I'm resilient, right? I'm moving forward. What else is left for me? Because I'm always learning, right? So what is the next thing that I need? Maybe it's executive leadership training. Maybe it's, you know, I, I don't know. There's lots of different opportunities out there. Um, and so all I would say is, you know, look at after every challenging moment. It doesn't have to be some major disaster, right? We can do this in, in everything that we do. Looking at this morning, I had a plan to get to my office on time, okay? <laughs> I swear, I did. That was part of my daily plan for today, okay? I knew that I needed to get to a meeting. I needed to print stuff off and I need to be there by 8.15. I normally leave my house about 8.45, 8.50. In the summer, I did get a little bit lax in my schedule. I'm gonna be real honest, but I was like, okay. I told my oldest son, we're leaving at 7.30 this morning. We're gonna be ready. I had that plan. And guess what time I rolled into the office? 8.15. <laughs> I left like 20, 30 minutes earlier than I normally do. And I still got there at 8.15 today. So as part of my reflection for uh, tomorrow is I'm not going to schedule 8.15 meetings, right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't schedule that meeting, by the way, because I would never do that to myself. But again, <laughs> the point is even small things in your life, you can constantly be looking at, okay, what went well, what didn't, and how can I improve on that? Okay, so I know I talk really fast, so I apologize for that, but that's just part of my nature. But in conclusion, emergency management is a cycle, right? Never ending. We're always in that loop, going through those four phases of emergency management. We're constantly looking at what were our plans? Um, were they successful? Um, what do we need to change? What are the training gaps? Oh, we had to implement the plan. Let's look at that and figure out, okay, what do we need to improve upon, right? We're constantly working towards building a more resilient community. We want whatever comes our way for our community to be able to come back up after that disaster and continue to be better and stronger. And the same thing applies for our lives, right? We constantly need to be looking at ourselves. What is my plan? Whether it's my weekly plan, whether it's my overarching strategic plan, what are my goals, right? What are my goals in life? What training or things do I need in order to be successful at those goals? And then once the challenges roll our way, right, whatever happens, um, how do I adjust to that? And how do I keep going, right? How do I continue to be as resilient as possible in my personal life? 
So hopefully in this very fast paced, because I'm just a fast talker presentation, you have learned that the principles of emergency management can be used to plan for, respond to, and recover from anything that life throws your way. So with that, I will open it up to questions. Oh. Thank you. All right, go ahead. What was the pivoting point that you decided to go down this like emergency management career? You might want to repeat it. Okay. So the question was, what was the pivoting point that made me decide to go down the emergency management career path? Okay. So I actually came to AM um, not knowing anything about emergency management. I'd never even heard about it, right? I came to AM. I thought I wanted to go to med school because that's what they tell you when you're smart. They're like, hey, you're smart. You need to go to med school, right? That's just like, I don't know if it's a Hispanic thing or what, they want you to go in the medical field. So um, that's what I thought I was gonna do, right? Um, and I came to AM and my first week here, um, the new, like new student MSC open house. Oh yeah, MSC open house, that was it. There was the ambulance uh, sitting out there and they're like, hey, come here, we're looking for volunteers. At the time, University EMS was all student run, um, all volunteer. And so I was like, oh, this is going to look great on a med school application, right? I'm going to join University EMS. It's going to be fun. Um, they trained me as a 911 dispatcher because I didn't have any certifications. I fell in love with it. I signed up for night classes um, at the fire field to get my EMT basic. And um, so that's kind of how I started working my way up. Eventually, I made my way to be the medical liaison in the command post at Kyle Field. And so I got to see how all of the different organizations and groups work together for that special event. And it really kind of piqued my interest. And so after that, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to med school. That's going to take too long. Holy moly. I don't want to do that. Um, so once I graduated, I worked for University EMS for a little bit. And then when opportunity opened up in safety and security, I took it and kind of ran with it. So, yeah. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. So um, what do you guys do in your uh, command post to prepare for a training your role in the group and, you know, with the training one on some yeah, absolutely. So the question was, what do we do to prepare for train derailments um, in our command post? So really, the appropriate emergency management answer is that we stick to our plans, right? Those foundational core capabilities that we practice and train on regularly, coordination, communication. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter what the emergency is, right? We're going to put those foundational pieces um, into place regardless. That said, we have done uh, training with Union Pacific, their hazmat team um, has come out and done, especially recently with all of our first responders, we've actually hosted it on campus several times. So, you know, we would treat it like any other hazmat situation, right? College Station Fire Department or Bryan Fire Department would respond. They would be the first on scene. Um, dispatch would contact Union Pacific. We would figure out what the manifest is for the train. We'll figure out what kind of hazards are on there. And then thankfully, we would be able to get Union Pacific's um, hazmat team here very quickly. Um, and then we would go from there, whether that involves shelter in place, evacuations. Um, you know, we'd have to just see what came up. All right, other questions? Hank. Can you talk a little bit, uh, Monica, about some of the uh, more challenging things that you all have to deal with? Yeah, so talk about the most challenging things that we've had in emergency management. Um, so I mentioned the controversial speaker and protests. That's been one of those things. Um, I've had the opportunity to work kind of a variety of things. Looking back, we've had, you know, uh, armed subjects on campus. I don't know if you guys remember uh, the person who was walking across campus with the rubber gun. Mm -hmm. This was like, I don't even know, 12, 13 years ago, maybe. Um, his punishment for that was having to come talk to me for like uh, six weeks. He had to do a class on emergency management and what that meant. Um, so that was fun. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't hear the joke. Uh, <laughs> The campus-wide bomb threat evacuation. I don't know how many people remember that. Um, so that was another opportunity where we were following the trends that were happening across the nation. People were calling in, um, you know, 
non-facility specific bomb threats on campus, right? Um, and so different universities out there were saying, okay, we're gonna evacuate all of campus. Well, for a campus our size, it's not that easy, right? But we went to our leadership, we said, hey, this is happening across the nation. It's only a matter of time before it happens to us. So, you know, what what is your comfort level? And they said, hey, if it happens to us, we're evacuating. Um, if there's time to leave in our cars, we'll evacuate in our cars. If not, we're gonna evacuate on foot. So the call came in for us about noon on the Friday before our very first home football game against LSU. We had joined the SEC that year. And, um, you know, it was it was fun, right? Um, <laughs> we evacuated campus. We had lots of lessons learned related to our communication, um, rally points, bus areas, things like that. But for the most part, it went as well as could be expected. We were able to reopen campus by about six o'clock that evening so that um, everybody could still do all of their pregame things that they do on a Friday night before a football game. And then we continued to systematically search the buildings uh, throughout the weekend just to say that we we did, um, which, you know, 802 plus buildings is quite a few buildings to say that we've touched and looked through, um, but we were able to reopen that Monday morning without any problems. So just another example. Um, I'm trying to think there's just been so many. Um, I've, I've been very blessed in my career that there have been lots of things that happened on our campus. Um, we had a student who took sodium cyanide from the lab, committed suicide um, in the middle of campus. We had to decon, we didn't know at the time that that's what we had done. So we had to decon um, the ambulance and also they had gone to the hospital. We had to decon the area, um, you know, there in the plaza, the academic plaza, Rudder Plaza. Um, you know, so lots of different things that have impacted us where we've had to implement our plans. But I can tell you, you know, we're just so very fortunate to have the relationships that we have with our interjurisdictional partners. Um, again, I didn't go into details about the Emergency Operations Center that we share with the cities and the county, um, but we're very fortunate to have that. Um, we're very fortunate for our seven home football games a year, um, not because we get to have fun. Um, but mostly because we get to sit together in the command post, practice our plans, practice our communications, making sure everybody um, you know, knows how to work the radio or log things into Web EOC. Um, and we just really get to build those relationships with those people so that when something does happen, we're like, oh yeah, I recognize so-and-so. They're always at the command post at Kyle Field, right? Or whatever the case may be. So we're very fortunate for that as well. Any other questions? I have one. Okay. What is the most frequent gap you find after doing an after action review? Can anybody guess? I have one guess. Communications, communications <laughs> always. Um, communications is always so critical. Um, I think part of the problem is that everybody just assumes that it's going to happen like instantaneously, right? Um, and our plans even say like, oh, and automatically everyone will know what's happening, right? And it's like, well, it happens a little bit more organically than that, right? It's gonna be a text message to somebody. It's gonna be a phone call here. Um, you know, it, it's gonna go through the grapevine, if you will, in some situations. Um, and so that can definitely be a challenge. I think internal communications within your organization is always critical. Um, with an organization, our size, it's always impossible. We're never gonna make everybody happy. We're never gonna have communicated to all of the right people at exactly the right time, right? So all we can do is you know, try our very best. But then also the flip side is that public information and warning, that external communication that I have found to be so critically important. And um, I actually teach um, a class on crisis communications for special events. Um, but one of the things is just making sure that you're communicating effectively with the people uh, about the situation and how it impacts them, right? Um, I learned one of the events that I didn't talk about, uh, Hank, was the El Dorado chemical fire. Do you guys remember that? Some of you all in the room remember. Um, but that was really, that was in 2009, for those of you in the room. Um, 
I learned that it doesn't matter how amazing your response is if you don't communicate effectively to the public on what's happening, um, what the hazards are, and what the implications are for them, then you have failed at that response. So since that day, even though it was a county-centric incident, and even though City of Bryan was the lead, um, I was um, in the emergency operations center at the time supporting, and I learned from that moment that if we are not hand in hand with our PIOs, if we are not getting them the information that they need so that they can push that message out, then we are failing at that response. And so that is one thing that I always make sure anytime I'm in the EOC that we are getting that information out, that we're communicating with the PIOs. Um, that's also a responsibility that I have um, with a and is to support Code Maroon to get things out on the emergency website. And part of that is because I truly believe that it's absolutely critical. When something's going on, the public has got to know what actions they need to be taking to protect themselves or what to expect in that particular situation. Yes, ma'am. I don't know if you can answer this, but what would you consider the most frustrating stakeholders that we have to Oh, man, that is a loaded question. <laughs> So the question was, um, what or who are the most frustrating stakeholders? Um, I think that the most frustrating stakeholders are the ones who don't want to be there, right? You're always going to run into those people who maybe they were voluntold to be there. Maybe they really haven't had the opportunity to learn much about your organization or your goals or your mission or what you're trying to accomplish. So they you know, are not as engaged on what you're trying to accomplish. And so I would say that those are ultimately the most frustrating stakeholders. Was that PC enough? Okay. <laughs> this is my crisis communication background, yeah. right? I know, like this is being recorded. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, good job, good job. Try to throw me, throw me for a loop. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, so you said you're a list maker or a task checker offer. Mm -hmm. Do you find that it's just works best for you in a work environment or do you also put that into your personal life and help you prepare for your work life? Um, so I do a little bit of both. Um, and I can tell you that when I am on top of my list game, I feel just much more relaxed because I feel like I don't have to keep the mental load of remember ev remembering everything, right? Um, I can put it down. I'm like, okay, I have that written down. I know I'm not going to forget about it. So it's not just swimming in my brain like, oh, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, right? Um, and so that's where I find the value of lists for me personally. Um, sometimes when I'm running ragged and I don't take the time to make my lists, I can feel it because I'll wake up at three in the morning and I'll be like, oh, like, okay, and don't forget to do that, right? Oh, and you never talk to Leslie about this or whatever, right? Whatever the case may be. I feel like for me, being able to write things down, feel organized. Okay, these are my priorities for the day or for the week or whatever. Okay, I need to get with so-and-so. And then I love to be able to cross things off, right? Like, yes, I actually did something, right? 15 other things came up today, but I actually got this one thing done on the list that I said I needed to get done. Um, and so for me, that's really the value. Um, I've tried bullet journaling, I've tried all of these different things, but really I just like a simple plain notebook where I can just write. And then sometimes on those lists, they gotta get transferred to the next page or to the next week or whatever, and that's okay. Um, but I feel like when I write everything down, it just helps me stay mentally organized as well. So. All right, other questions? Yeah. Okay. So as a female in this particular um, career field, mm -hmm. Of what challenges have you experienced over your career that may not have been faced by male colleagues? And mm -hmm. how have you seen uh, the field evolve over your um, time span for females? Okay, so the question for those online was um, how or what is it like being a female in a male dominated profession? Um, and how have I, what are the challenges and how have I seen that evolve over time? Um, well, I definitely have faced challenges in that regard. You know, one being a, a young female um, in a profession that oftentimes is led by, um, you know, males who are 
in their second career, right? They're retired. Um, they've you know been there for a while and they're coming into emergency management. Most of the time you're seeing, you know, retired firefighters, retired police officers, things like that. Um, and so, you know, in my very beginning stages, I definitely ran into situations where it's like, oh, not only are you the youngest and only female in the room, but you can take the notes because, you know, you're the only female in the room, right? Um, I stopped carrying paper into my meetings, <laughs> right? I'm not taking any notes here. No, I'm just joking. Um, but, you know, that that, you know, takes some time. Hey, I'm a professional. I, I've worked hard to be in this position. And so I think part of the way that I kind of counteracted that is just by working really hard, by volunteering for those leadership positions, by trying to show that, hey, I'm meant to be here. Um, you know, yes, I'm young, but I have the skills. I've done the training. I have the experience, um, you know, to be taken seriously. And I've been very fortunate, as I mentioned earlier, that my mentor, uh, Chris Meyer, he never treated me like anything less than what I was. And he always gave me those opportunities. And he made sure that when I was in a room, um, even if I was the only female, he didn't speak for me, right? He said, okay, well, Monica's going to speak. This is her area, right? And so I think that's where having those mentors who are there to kind of can help you get that leg up sometimes can be challenging. Um, I have seen... Um, the profession change. You've seen a lot more younger professionals coming into emergency management. So people who are not starting emergency management as a second career, right? People who are graduating in emergency management with degrees um, and coming into the profession. And I do see that they also kind of struggle with some of that as well, being the younger person on the team, right? Um, and being taken seriously. So I think it's something that we will continue to um, have to work towards as well. But I don't know that I have a great answer for that. Yes, ma'am. We have an online question. Um, it's kind of a two questioner. It says, does a and slash BCS utilize an all hazards approach? It seems like we are uniquely positioned, like the protests and counter protests of the MSC you mentioned, to experience multi hazard events. Um, and also, do you have any recommendations for prepping for events like this? Maybe recommendations we could use in our personal lives? For protests in particular? So, to answer the first part of the question, yes, we do have an all hazards approach that we take. So we're actually in the process of transitioning from our kind of functional annexes to emergency support functions. So we're going to mirror what the state is doing with their emergency support functions and their annexes. So we are in the process of doing that. And as far as preparing for finding yourself in some type of civil disturbance type situation in your personal life, um, I think the big thing is just being aware of your surroundings, right? I employ this for anywhere I go, whether it's a concert or a basketball game or a football game is, you know, being aware of your surroundings, making sure that you kind of have that exit strategy in mind. Okay, I'm here, but there's an emergency exit there. If the crowd gets to, uh, you know, condensed or dense, then maybe I want to pull back or I want to keep my family off to the side. Maybe I want to get there early, um, you know, those kind of things. And so really, it's just about maintaining that situational awareness about where you are and what's going on around you. Other questions? All right, I guess that's it. Well, Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate the time. So thank you, Monica. I'd like to do a little closing and kind of recap um, the key takeaways. And I love how you tied in emergency management. I think a lot of us in this room are tied into that emergency response and in these situations. So um, it's good to have it just in our professional lives, but then also taking it and putting it into our personal life. So I took away um, building the relationships first, like identifying those stakeholders um, and just building the relationships with people who are gonna help lift you up and carry you through your plan. Um, and then the mitigation, you can't really take care of anything. I know that as a mom, I can't, I can't take care of my family if I'm not taking care of myself. So having that as like, underlying um, and then establishing that preventative maintenance. Um, and then the preparedness, um, I took that, you know, practice makes perfect. Um, having the to-do list, I have a million to-do lists and I probably 99% have to carry it over to the next, <laughs> the next day. Me too. On a like daily basis. And I think 
oh, way to hold up, but rewriting my to-do list, but that's okay. okay. I, I, I cross it off um, eventually. Um, and then the response, I, I love the remember the plan, trust your training, um, but adjust accordingly. We all we all have those pivotal moments that we have to be adaptable or you know, whatever. Um, and then the recovery, um, restoring ourselves back to normal um, and then being resilient. Um, I wrote down working on building more resilient community or a more resilient self. So we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And I think for future, we have a season in September. I'm going to jump to um, the next slide. We'll be getting um, oh, uh, Amy Swinford. Um, and so then we have a few more coming up in the fall. So stay tuned for those invites. And I'd love to see this full room here. Thank you, Thank you so much.